Commission workshop into order this Monday, May 8th. City Clerk, can we please call the roll? Commissioner Vila Vasquez? Present. Commissioner Burbank? Absent. Commissioner Colwell? Here. Commissioner Doty Lee? Here. Commissioner McCool? Here. Vice Mayor Bradford? Here. And Mayor Avila? Here. This time, can we please stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May be seated. This time we'll be doing a presentation from Halifax Health, uh, UF Medical Center of Deltona. Mr. Rafael Ramirez, please. Thank you, Mayor. Joyce, thanks for the ladies for setting this up for us. Mayor, commissioners, we have um, a couple of us here representing the Medical Center of Deltona. Um, quickly, uh, Ben Evie, who is our administrator. Uh, ben came to um, our hospice uh, operation several years ago and directed it to become the highest rated, highest independently rated operation in our markets. Um, he's now the director uh, or the administrator of both the Port Orange and the uh, Deltona hospitals. I think everybody knows Tanya, uh, who is our director of operations here in Deltona. She's um, spearheaded a lot of the expansions and services at the, uh, at the facility. And then our speaker is Matt Pecos, who is the vice president of uh, physician services. I'm gonna let Matt talk a little bit about himself. He's got some statistics and then kind of tell you what's coming and uh, what's happening at the hospital. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ralph. Good evening, good evening, Mayor. Commissioners, thanks for having me. I'm not, um, I'm not generally as entertaining as Raphael, but I will, I will do my best. So um, I've been with Halifax Health for 25 years. My responsibility currently for the health system is to help develop the physician strategy for the hospital and for the health system. And then my team that works for me are the ones who go and recruit the physicians and convince them to come to these facilities and, and work with us on our different programs. So um, I will tell you that one of the greatest pleasures I've had in my professional career so far is the unique opportunity of, of working with the city of Deltona on the medical center here. It's not often that you get the chance in healthcare to start on right from the, from the land to the site development, to the hospital development, to the staff development, to going out and recruiting the providers and starting um, a, a, a hospital. It, it's been um, a great journey and um, truly enjoy working with everybody in the community. So a couple quick updates on Medical Center of Deltona, where we are from a statistics point of view. So admissions, since the facility opened, 4,500 admissions to the hospital, um, almost 100, nine, just under 100,000, 98,000 emergency room visits, and over 32 surgeries so far. So um, it's been, th this past uh, spring, I will tell you, it's been exceptionally busy. I think it's a reflection of the number of people that are coming into the community and, and, and joining us here in Florida. And of course, that's um, not necessarily unique to the Deltona volumes. It's also what we're seeing in the, the uh, main campus in Daytona Beach and also in Port Orange. So I'm gonna see, okay, great. So I work with both the University of Florida, I kind of uh, straddle a bridge between Halifax and UF. So I work with UF on certain programs and strategies with their team, and then I work with the Halifax group on some strategies with them. So I'm gonna kind of give you just a quick brief update on where we are with some different physician strategies for on both sides. Um, the biggest growth that we've seen over the last year is in vascular surgery. So um, UF has grown the program now to three surgeons, and one of the surgeons, Dr. Michael Yacoub, his primary office is now here in Deltona on the, um, uh, uh, on the campus here. He sees on a typical, he has two clinic days a week, he'll see 35 to 40 patients on a typical day. So. Um, 
we, we, um, we added a, a vascular lab. So a vascular lab is a, a place where you do non-invasive testing, ultrasounds, and a test we call an ABI to look for vascular disease in patients. And um, that clinic just, his vascular clinic just got open, so we'd expect the volume in his clinic to probably double within the next, um, next couple of weeks. So orthopedic surgery. Here's the great thing about orthopedic surgery in Deltona is Dr. Hayden has been so well received and we're getting such good positive feedback from people about who are going to see him and the experience they're having at Deltona that the people in Del Daytona are asking for access to him as well. So he's doing an every other Friday clinic in Daytona, but he doesn't have privileges in Daytona and that's, where, that's, a, that's actually a purposeful strategy. So he will be doing all of his surgeries here at the, at the Deltona hospital. Um, and he's just started that, but again, received very well. General surgery, um, we, we started with three general surgeons that, um, here. Um, we're, we're gonna go to like two, and not really part-time, but two with one covering call. The one surgeon's practice, he's, he's from Central Florida. Um, he, he has some interest in, in providing services to some of the hospitals in Central Florida. We're gonna allow him to remain on call um, and, and, but, and still cover services in the, in the Deltona facility, but we still have two full-time surgeons, Dr. Bautista and Dr. Arlano. Dr. Bautista is very focused on oncologic surgeries, such as uh, breast surgeries for women with breast cancer, and um, Dr. Arlano is focused on getting us a bariatric center of excellence. Um, he's focused on doing bariatric surgery. Starting July 1st, and this is an exciting development for us, is uh, UF Health will be assisting us with telestroke coverage. So for the whole system, so that means that their um, neurologists in Gainesville using the telehealth system will be covering uh, Deltona for stroke if you show up to the emergency room, Daytona and Port Orange. So, th and they are our neurology strategy moving forward. And so there's more to come on this, um, but this is what we're starting with July 1st. Um, urology, we've, you, we have one of the number two reasons to transfer a patient out of the uh, Deltona facility is for uh, urologic reason. And uh, we've recruited, we've actually recruited four. Uh, there's a third coming this year. There's another one coming next year. But Dr. Sidelsky is starting with us in July. And so we're gonna ask him to start on then the urology program to start seeing patients in the Deltona hospital because they don't currently, and that's what causes the transfers. And then for, with the fourth, we'll, we'll look to set our clinic up here in Deltona. There's a physician, Dr. Soon Sutton, female urologist who's joining next year, but she's already committed and signed to us. And then this just came up recently. It was an exciting opportunity. Um, we have a position posted currently for a thoracic surgeon. So the number, uh, number three cause of cancer in the United States is thoracic surgery, the most, pre most prevalent um, cancer, it's also, but it's also the deadliest. Um, and so there's a large amount of uh, pulmonary disease in our communities. And so we have a position posted for thoracic surgery. We actually have a physician who is, has an offer out now and, and he will have a clinic in Deltona. So that's, the, that's kind of the conclusion for the UF programs. I'm gonna slide on over to what we're working on the Halifax side. On the Halifax side, this, is, this one's coming up, up and coming and, and probably one of my most asked about programs. Medical oncology, we have a site for medical oncology in the facility. Um, we have recruited the physician, he is here already, and now we're just working through getting that site set up to be accepted by the payers, be able to bill from that location and, and set up our um, clinical operations, so excited about that. Pulmonology. Um, we have a pulmonology clinic that's in the, the medical office building on the first floor. Um, we have recruited four, now four pulmonologists, two of whom will be providing services in the clinic. One are, is already there, Dr. Gingivadia, and we're adding pulmonary function testing. Today, if you saw a pulmonologist there and they wanted to do a pulmonary function test on you, they would refer you to, back to Daytona. We don't want those patients to have to travel, so we're setting up pulmonary function testing there. Um, Cardiology, so if, if you're not aware, we, we have a, a, an exclusive contract with Daytona Heart Group, who is a pretty large group in Volusia County. They have six physicians on this side. In this side of the county, they have seven physicians on the east side of the county. 
Um, we're working with them on a monthly basis uh, to do what we can to reduce the transfers. Cardiology is a little bit unique in the state of Florida. There's three level licensing for cardiology. In order for us to start taking care of patients with heart attacks at that facility and start doing cardiac interventions like stents and angioplasties, we have to show the state that we have at least 300 people a year coming to the hospital for, re for cardiac reasons, either chest pain, heart failure, um, and whatnot. So we're not there yet. The last time we looked at this, we were just under 100 patients in the last year. We expect this to continue to grow as the ER volume grows. We do have a chest pain center there that also um, kind of captures some of that volume. So right now now we're level one, that would be level two, which is a cardiac program uh, without, uh, it's, a, it's called a PCI, percutaneous cardiac intervention cardiology program without surgical backup. So um, again, I'm, my anticipation is that within the next year and a half that we would be able to apply for the state for that. And then we could start taking care of patients with heart attacks in Deltona. And um, orthopedics for, on the, day, on the Halifax side, and uh, just so you're aware, Florida Orthopedic Associates, which is a group here in town, has really made a big investment of time in the facility and, and right now are doing the bulk of the, uh, of, of the orthopedic surgeries at Deltona and growing, um, growing their volume there. But just thought that was nice. It's a practice that's known to the community, well-established and, and very invested in the facility, so. That's all I have for updates on programs, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Commissioner McCool and then Commissioner Jody Lee. Thank you for this um, presentation. And sure. I will tell you that you have two great ambassadors in this area with Raphael and Ms. Tanya. Um, Calling them time after time, they step up to the plate for the community of Deltona. And so they are, you, it is an honor to watch you shepherd in these new services. Um, please know that uh, Deltona supports Halifax. Um, we're appreciative of the good health care that you're bringing and uh, the way that you are growing with Deltona. And so uh, thank you very much for updating us also. It's great that we can share this with our community to let them know the range of services available and what's coming up. So again, great job with our ambassadors for Halifax Health. We love these people here in our community. They go above and beyond all the time. So uh, again, thank you for bringing this to us. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, no, truly uh, great ambassadors for, for Halifax Health and the community. Commissioner Jody Lee. I'll echo everything she just said. Thank you for coming here. You know, we love Halifax. I've used it myself for my elderly in-laws and family members. You know, one thing I would like to see is more pediatrics. I hope we can get that someday. We have like 30% of our population in town that could be used for pediatrics. So we have a big need for our city for pediatrics. So, so uh, we, we started a pediatric, when we opened, we did have a pediatric practice we started. And we're, we're currently recruiting peds and, and, and working on that strategy overall for the whole system. Um, the, the, the practice didn't quite quite develop um, as quickly as we thought it would. There are some changes in the dynamics in your community for pediatrics right now. There is a group out of Orlando that's acquiring practices. Um, and there's one pediatrician that's actually transitioning over to us. So one of the things that I think will be very helpful is, is when, when we do re reinvest in that pediatric practice is helping us understand how we um, communicate, what's the best way to communicate with the citizens. Well, like again, so. I, I appreciate it. In my family, it's the older and the grandkids. So yeah. between, I'm good. But yeah. I want to thank you again. Yeah, absolutely. Commissioner Avila Vasquez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a question. Your uh, neurology section, is, yes, does, is it just for strokes? Do you have anybody there yet for, you know, brain tumors, uh, aneurysms, and anything like oh, that? Oh, neurosurgery. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a, a, a I'm going to give you a little bit on neurology, which is um, the, the non-surgical side of, of uh, um, the nervous system disorders and the neurosurgery. So um, neurology right now has kind of a split strategy. You, with UF, we didn't want to overwhelm them all at once with uh, telestroke. We're also recruiting neurologists through the University of Florida into the community full-time. We don't have them today. 
So in Deltona today, we have telehealth for stroke that we're starting with UF in, in July. We use a company out of South Florida for teleneurology in the, on the floor. So when a patient's on the floor and they have an issue and there's a need for them, which is not great, right? It, it works, but what you really want is an in-person physician. I think we all feel more comfortable with that. So we're working right now, we, I have, we have two positions posted for the system to start vascular hospitalist-based neurologists. And then as part of neurosciences, we're gonna be recruiting um, practice-based neurologists. So that's one, that's one component, so that's coming. Neurosurgery, we started neurosurgery here, and then um, we've had one of the, the neurosurgeon that was here decided to go back to South Florida, and so we were just recruiting again, and we have an off route for another. So as soon as, as soon as we can get where we've got six neurosurgeons, we'll start the clinic back up here. And Deltona will primarily focus initially on spine surgery. Um, we need the medical staff to evolve a little bit on the, um, on the intensive care side, the support on the intensive care side to be able to do in, what we call intracranial brain tumor work. But it will come, there's no doubt. Well, thank you so much and thank sure. you for the presentation. Sure, thank you, Commissioner. So first, I'd like to thank you guys. Um, when we started the Mayor's Fitness Challenge, you guys stepped right up and helped us take the BMIs. Tanya, big round of applause to you, so thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> gave us a lot of information on staying healthy, including for myself, right? <laughs> uh, I do have a couple questions. Sure. Uh, do you guys still transfer for trauma situations? So, uh, different. And, and sorry, and if so, is that something you guys are looking forward to changing? So it's it's kind of an, so yes, generally trauma, you, in the state of Florida, you have to be a designated trauma center to accept trauma. So um, there's level ones and level twos. So, um, so I don't think we're looking to change that designation for Deltona. Now I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put an asterisk next to this what we call isolated trauma or isolated orthopedic trauma, we will, we will still hold on to some of those. Someone who falls and breaks a hip is technically a trauma. Um, and, and we don't want those patients to have to leave the community. A fall, break your wrist, fall, break your hip. It's an isolated fracture, it's an isolated break. We generally like to keep those people here. Um, but, but poly trauma, you know, more than one system involved has to go to a designated trauma center. I don't think we're currently looking at creating a trauma center for Deltona. Um, but again, I don't know what the future holds, but not current, it's not currently part of the strategy. I, I ask because we have uh, the capabilities of landing a helicopter in that hospital, and I, I hate that we're kind of not providing that service when it's there. I mean, we have the largest residents in the whole county. Sure. Um, so that's something that, I mean, I, I'm only one person, but I would love for us to look into that because I'm sure our residents can benefit from that. Absolutely. Um, just out of curiosity, how many employees roughly do you guys currently have About at four, that hospital? Oh, at the hospital, gosh. There's 4,000 employees in the health system. I would bet there's probably, okay, 250, yeah. Okay. And that's at any given time or in total? In total. Okay. And that's, uh, that's, it's kind of a challenging number because we do float employees back and forth between the facilities. So, I mean, at busier times, we, would, we could expand that up. That could be 300 employees in, in busier times. Have you guys thought about, maybe you guys are doing this now, but um, working with some of the schools to kind of provide some type of, uh, I don't know if it's an internship or something where the students can kind of start developing some experience out of Halifax Health specifically there. Yeah, actually we do that now with our okay. student nurse intern program. I mean, I don't think it's a, it's a, it's, it would be unknown to any of you that the nursing shortage in, in the nation and in Florida is a, a particularly big issue. Yes, we have a, a, an awesome student nurse intern program where, um, where uh, uh, people who are in nursing school can come in, they can train side by side, uh, they can, um, and then we, we have uh, very experienced uh, nurses who, um, we'll coach them on the NCLEX. The NCLEX is the national exam that they take so that they can become a nurse. And our pass rate, Tanya, I don't have those numbers specifically. I, it, it's been tremendously well received. One of the challenges that we're having is it's, 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 it, it, it's been so successful. We're actually having nurses from Central Florida come over to, um, to use the program. Awesome, so lastly, before I go to the Vice Mayor, 
Um, I did, and I'm glad Commissioner Jody Lee brought this up again regarding pediatrics. I know I had a lot of Raphael's laughing because him and I had a very long conversation about this. <laughs> you can ask me about. I'm sure. uh, you can ask me about OB, ser o OB sure. services. Children's Hospital. Look, it, it, obviously, I, I have some self-interest in it. I have one, a little girl that's under two years, and I have another one coming. But more than anything, uh, Commissioner Jody Lee said it. We we have a large population of kids, and let me tell you, um, I experienced it for the first time. One thing is a niece and a nephew, but when it's your child, and I had to rush mine to the hospital. They took amazing care of my daughter the day I took her, high fever, but I was told if it's needed, you're gonna have to take her to Daytona Beach, and there's nothing more scarier than thinking, I'm gonna have to take my daughter 30, 40 minutes away with the potential of that the fevers don't go down, she's gonna start having seizures. So, I mean, I don't know what you guys have to do, but as a father, right, and yeah. as Commissioner Jody Lee said, I'm sure others up here share the same thing, we, we need one desperately. So, so if you think about uh, the development of a medical staff like a pyramid, and think about there are some, some foundational medical staff members that we need there, and we have to provide these services and do them really well, and that's the things that we've been working on the last couple of years in particular, cardiology, orthopedics, general surgery, GI, neurology, I mean, th these are things that that facility has to have. In the state of Florida, you have to have them, and we need to do them well. So as, you, as we build this up, and as we have more specialists come in, as you get closer to the, the top of the pyramid, that's when you start asking yourself questions like, are we serving the community from a pediatric perspective? So again, initially what we saw with peds was a little bit of a soft start. I'd like to try it again and see how we do. That, that was more related to the, the business dynamic that was going on between the competitive practices here in Deltona, but that's changing, so. Thank you again. Thank you guys for everything you do, uh, Vice Mayor Bradford. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Again, thank you. Welcome to everybody's thanks and praise to you guys. Sure. So I'm just gonna ask the question. Has the ambulance has been delivering to the hospital, or are we still running into the same scenario that we did before where they were going to Orange City and around? Are they actually being transported to your facility more now than they were in the past? And I don't know if you have that answer. That was a problem, and I don't even know if Mr. Chisholm knows about it. That was a problem we were seeing where they were being transported to nearby cities more than they were being transported here for whatever reason. I think a little bit had to do with the county. Um, has that problem been fixed? No, I'm not, not from my, I mean, when I looked at the last set of statistics and Tanya, I mean, you can so answer. So that would be a great thing. Like Mr. Chisholm's our new interim city manager. That has been a ongoing problem that both of our facilities in Deltona have been experiencing is that our, the county is kind of skipping Deltona and they're taking them directly over to nearby hospitals and facilities. Um, I, whatever reason it is, it's great for them, but not great for us. These guys have invested in our city and we need to make sure that they're getting their fair share of transport to me, that's a that's pretty critical to keep these guys running all of them. Uh, I guess, as you know, the uh, dispatch is as, is actually through the county system. Yes, sir. And the physician is uh, hired by the county, so that's probably where where the direction's coming. But of course, I think all all um, emergency response facilities are um, paramount to our community and. Um, the people that are on our ambulances, they certainly want to get to the closest facility that has the equipment and the knowledge and the personnel necessary to uh, attend to the patients they're carrying. Well, and prior to them being opened as a full hospital, the excuse was, oh, if they have to be admitted, then, you know, they, they got to be retransported again. They're, we don't have that problem now. You know, we've, as you said, you've had 4,500 missions, so obviously now they're able to admit. So that's not very good logic to me, and I'm saying this in a very nice way, but at the same time, this need, we're gonna have to eventually fight this battle. Because for our residents, if Halifax is closer, they need to be going to Halifax instead of going over to Orange City. 
Deltona residents need to be staying in Deltona if at all possible. I mean, obviously for trauma alerts, items like that, I understand the necessity to transport out, but this is ridiculous. This has been going on for what, four years now? So, you know, we were like, oh, when they get it straight, oh, when they, they're straight. So I don't see any reason for any more excuses. I think our, I think Deltona has been transporting, but I don't know if the county has been doing their share of it. Okay. So I, you know, I would love for you to see what you can do. You've been sure. pretty magical so far. So that's just my two cents, but what do I know? Yeah, Vice Mayor, that's, no, it's a, it's a great question. And I'll, I'll bring up a very specific example I just talked about earlier, which is the development of a, a robust cardiology program here. The state of Florida requires us to take care of at least 300 patients for some heart reason, some cardiac reason, in order for us to advance from level one to level two, so we can take uh, what we offer the community, take care of heart attack patients or whatnot. And so when those ambulances go past the hospital, that's just hurting our ability to advance that particular program. And I don't, I think all of us know somebody, I mean, heart disease is one of the most pre prevalent diseases in the U.S. We all know somebody who's been impacted by heart disease, right? And, and getting access to quick care. Now, I'm not suggesting that today, if, you, if a patient's having a heart attack in the community, particularly in Deltona, that that's where the, the ambulance should go there. That's not a situation in which they should go there. But we see, we see cardiac patients for lots of reasons and can take care of lots of those reasons right here in Deltona. And, and you know, I put that hand in hand with some of the programs possibly failing in the beginning. You know, just like the pediatric program, how many times was the hospital skipped and they were transported elsewhere because, oh, we didn't want to take it to Halifax. Sure. You know, so I'm, I'm going to attribute a lot to what's been going on at the county and, you know, um, Mr. Chisholm's been able to do wonders and we'll see if you know he can give it a whirl and see what we can get this fixed. Thank you. But again, thank you guys for being the community. You know, you guys are always out and about. You're not just a hospital on the corner. You know, you guys are active in the community. That means a lot to all of us. You know, and thank you for taking the time to come tonight. No, thank you for having me. Commissioner, I just wanted to um, add briefly, I stayed in touch uh, with Chief Nider. Um, and uh, Matt just hit the nail right on the head. I mean, I think we're, you know, we'll probably be seeing a massive change in that disparity um, come the next few months. Um, I, it's hard to drill down on, on some of those statistics, and I would love to do that because I still think there's many patients that can be closer to care coming to us. but. Um, I think what Matt said about the cardio, um, um, the cardiology, and the same thing can be said about strokes. Once we get to that point, um, then you, they, at that point there won't be any argument or excuse. So, thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you. See ya. Thank you, very much. thank you guys for the presentation again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your time. This time we're gonna have discussion regarding chapter 110 zoning article eight, section 110-806, fences, walls, and hedges of city's code of ordinances requested by Commissioner Jody Lee. If we can please have someone from code enforcement or the city manager. Hello, oh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm not aware of exactly what uh, y'all want to discuss, but we have the the uh, code before you it's in, in your package, uh, fences, walls, hedges, and the city's code of ordinances and the ordinance itself. Is there a particular area of the ordinance that you would like to see uh, considered for change? Vice Mayor Bradford. Oh, thank you so much for bringing this up. This is one of the number one complaints that I get. And I have went through this and I am stumped. So I don't know if we have somebody here. Um, one of the biggest, a couple questions, okay. And I keep being told it's in the code, it's in the code. One of the things that I've gotten I can't even count how many calls on, is they're putting up a fence, um, they're on a corner lot, and they can only have a four foot fence, and I'm told it's in the code. Where is it at? One, two, hurricane came in, knocked down five panels, I need to pull a permit. Oh, 
M G. I can't just pull a permit. I have to go spend money on a new survey. Surveyors are booked out hmm, four months right now. Question is, and I was, I questioned it because I personally, I've had a ton of people call me up for this and I don't even want to touch it. Getting a permit to replace panels that have blown down and having to get a survey is just ridiculous. I mean, I don't even know how to say it. And I know you guys and building there, this is what I was told. It states in this that you have to have a permit to put a fence up. It doesn't say repair, doesn't say, you know, I'm gonna replace a fence with a fence. I was told in prior years, it was just what we did, not that there's any ordinance or code on it. So we kind of just made it up and did it. So, yeah, I went through it. Good luck finding it's not there, it. Is it. So I have individuals that have come down here and fought tooth and nail because they were told they live on a corner lot and that the fence on that side has to be four foot. They cannot go, even in their backyard. Um, they recently, with all these fence posts down, I think they were allowing, if you had two fence panels down, you didn't have to have a permit, but if you wanted to put more than two fence panels up, you needed to su supply a survey and pull a new permit. So is there another ordinance that I'm missing? No, we're aware of one. No, um, part, of the, part of what you're saying, Commissioner, uh, Joe Ruiz, planning, uh, Interim Director, Planning and Development Services. Uh, what, what, part of what you're asking is a two-part question. So one is uh, zoning related, the other is uh, building permit related. Um, the building of Freshwood is here to answer any, any of those questions that the, we, we had a discussion today about whether the building code requires fences or permits for fences. Uh, it, it's solely in our, in our code in 110.806 that a fence permit or a, a fence permit is required. Um, with that being said, as far as the height of four feet on a corner, uh, the code actually allows up to five feet uh, within the front yard um, and portions of that side street yard in the front unless it's set back a certain distance and then it can go up to the six feet. So I'm not sure where that four foot um, require or requirement has been being told. Um, what I do know is um, as far as from planning, um, how we enforce that or implement that code, um, and we are working on cleaning some stuff up from the zoning end, um, it is five feet allowed in the front yard, um, not four feet. Um, okay, yeah, right here on the paperwork, it does say um, four foot front yard. It's right on the document. It, so this is where there's drastic it, it, confusion. Is that a permit application? I'm sorry. So what we were Front just yard submitted. fences. So there is so much confusion on this, and this is where we get yelled at because they're like, show me the code, show me the code. And I'm sort of, oh, I don't have a code. And it is very costly for residents at this point and time consuming because like I said, you've got a lot of surveyors right now, unless it's like, hey, an update to a survey, they're booked out. And if I'm like, I get people move fences, I do get having a survey, but I think we need to come up with a good happy medium. So if part of somebody's fence is blown down, I think it's, and it's just me, but you guys, you guys are the ones, you can give me the reason, and I'll be okay if you give me a legit reason. Why are we getting a new survey? Um, and again, there would be told, like if their property line and they're on a corner lot, they're being told that that whole side, front and back, has to be at this four foot. And I don't know if this is out there, I don't know why. Um, they are not allowed to extend a five foot from front to back, because I had a lady like ripping me and then I had another couple and I'm just like, listen, I've already tried to fight it and I'm told no. So, so what I can tell you is that the diagram that I'm seeing here the, and what you're showing, the four foot, that is an outdated diagram. When the code was updated in 2016 that allowed the five foot, that should have been updated at that time. So that I So I, maybe I, that's I what clarify. staff's going by and we can get that updated. Yeah, so I'm, what about corner lots? I would like to see something that is very specific that addresses corner lots. So it's outlined because for us and for your staff, your staff is getting beat up because individuals are like, show me the code. Where's this code at? 
And if there's no code, then they're just like, well, this is what I was told and this is what you're doing. And then you've got residents ticked off who are gonna call us and then we're gonna turn around and call him. And then he's, it's, it's just like a, a wasted time. So corner lots is one item that needs addressed and repairing of fences, switching fences if we're staying on the same lot line, um, what can be done if it's like for like, or like to maybe there's a lot of people changing from wood fences to PVC fences, and they're being told as well that they need to pull a permit. Again, you guys tell me the necessity of it so that we have the knowledge and information to respond, I guess is the best yeah. word. Yeah, the, the requirement for the survey is to verify that the fence what, that is being located on their property, that it's not encroaching onto another person's property. But there's already been a previous permit pulled, there's an existing fence, Correct. and it's being put exactly back where it was. Why is a new permit and survey required? So in those cases, I can't speak for someone asking a requirement. What I can say is in those cases where we do have a record of a permit or it being a permitted fence, and we, we do try to see if they do have a survey on file from previous permit submittals, and we have worked with, some, with people to do that. I, I don't want to be a smart aleck, aleck, but no, I'm gonna tell you, understand. no, it's yeah. not happening. I've, yeah. what, we've, we've had customers come in, and like I said, they tell me the same thing. When they come down here, they are straight out told, if you are replacing, I think it's more than two or three panels, you have to provide a current survey, not more than, I think it's seven years old, and you have to pull a permit. That is exactly what they're being told. I don't wanna sound like a smart aleck, but I've got customers coming yeah. to me and that's what they're telling me. I, I can't speak for the building department. We are making some changes in zoning. Zoning has moved over to planning, but I will let the building official speak on what has been required previously. Welcome new building official. Thank you. <laughs> First, I would like to say that there's a great group of people that run the city of Deltona, and I am proud to be a part of this group. I have to agree with you. The fence issue by far uh, has really been, I, I feel your pain when it comes to this, um, and there's been many discussions that have gone on. What I would ultimately like to request um, on this topic is a little time that I can gather stuff and speak with you knowledgeably and give you references for uh, these specific items. To answer the question on the survey, and my understanding at this point is it's no more than 10 years old. 10 years, okay. There are some factors on that um, that do come into play because the 100 year floodplain, that varies and changes. Um, people add and change and move things. Sometimes uh, maybe slabs are in there. They may have been in there prior to the city being incorporated. They may be added. You never know where things were. So getting the survey that's accurate, that has the current, uh, the current conditions of that lot, that's kind of where that requirement came from. The difficult part on this, as uh, Joe was explaining, is there is a difference and a separation of zoning and building. So when we talk about the term permit, it's generalized in your ordinances and in what the building code says, because the ordinance says that a permit shall be required. There is a zoning permit and there is a building permit. So these are issues that now, when we get into all the specifics that are in there, there's a lot of stuff that's, can, even for, I tried reading through it and I'm juggling stuff. It's difficult because there is no clarity to it and it's, it's a big topic right now that we're really trying to work on with everybody's input because the code enforcement people, they see a lot of this stuff. Our permit techs are confronted every day with a different issue, a different scenario. It's a panel, it's a picket, it's a, whatever the case may be. So I would like to have the opportunity, you know, to get the building end and the zoning end clear definition and get the input of everybody involved that we can make something that makes more sense and is easy to read. That to me is awesome. And you telling me you're gonna do that, because I can tell you when I come to pull a permit, I will have at least one person each time I'm sitting there waiting 
and I feel so bad for staff because they're getting chewed by that person on the other side of the glass because they have to inform them, I need this, I need that, and they're like, uh. so to have the clarification, that's all I'm asking on both of those issues, corner lots, um, making very specific on this height, and what can we do, especially, and, and I don't know if we can do something during an emergency status to make it a little bit different, but um, there's, there's a lot of fences that just came down, and there's a lot of fences that aren't up yet, and I guarantee a lot of them are still waiting on surveys. Um, so I'm just gonna say I'm gonna give you the opportunity, and welcome to Deltona. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck. Was there any other questions regarding that? that go ahead. Commissioner Avila Vasquez, Commissioner Mercool, and then Commissioner Jody Lee. Thank you, Mayor. So my question is not about fences. My question, you could put walls or hedges, <clears throat> excuse me. So we, we come down on residents because of their garbage cans, not in the proper places. They have to be removed at a certain time once their garbage is picked up. There are codes for uh, dumpsters to be enclosed. Welcome to the city, by the way. Thank you. And yet, I drive around, and I can take you specifically to the places where dumpsters, garbage dumpsters, are on the sidewalks. They look disgusting. They're horrible. But yet, if it's a resident, we get on their case. But if it's a, a, an apartment complex, it's okay. Nobody says anything about it, although I have been complaining about it. And then you have other uh, rentals that have their garbage cans lined up on Deltona Boulevard, and that's okay. But if it was one resident in their homes, they would get fined. So I just need to understand when these hedges and walls to cover and surround these dumpsters and these garbage cans that are out there constantly, 24-7, when does the rule apply to them? You want to yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> You're new, David, I'll, I'll cover for you. <laughs> um, so as far as uh, chapter 110-806, which is uh, the topic at, or the, the code section at hand today, um, there is exceptions uh, if you look through the code in uh, item K. Uh, says the section shall not be applied to any agricultural, commercial, industrial, resource protection, public use classifications, or any publicly used property. So, Commissioner, to to your point, to what you're asking, really, that's a, a Chapter 110, Section 808, um, regarding dumpster enclosures, um, which does require that there that there be dumpster enclosures for for the dumpsters as well as landscaping around those dumpster enclosures. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a different code section because typically the properties that you're referring to are not residentially zoned but they're zoned commercial, industrial, or non-residential. But they're residential. Even though they're commercial, they're still residential because they're apartment rentals. Um, so, so with apartment rentals, like the newer projects like Integra, we, we do have um, th that section, uh, chapter 110, section 808 does apply. And so like when we did our site plan review, we verified that they have dumpster enclosures, um, improvements on their property and their, on their site plan that they're going to be providing. Okay, but the ones that are currently like that, they're okay? I mean... They're, they're not okay. And the reason, the reason why I'm bringing up, I'm sorry, Joe, uh, the mm -hmm. reason why I'm bringing this up is because it says, while protecting the scenic character, characteristics of the city. Mm -hmm. That's what it says about these codes, right? Mm -hmm. So to have these dumpsters in the middle of the road, in the middle of the right-of-way, um, just there, I mean, I, well... I haven't been able to send Mr. Chisholm anything, but there are months that I, it's emails coming from left to right from this particular section um, of mattresses all over the place, in the middle of the road, in the middle of the street, because the dumpsters are too packed. The city has had to pay mm -hmm. to have them remove and then, you know, charge the owner. We shouldn't have to do that. Can I make a suggestion? I, I think you just brought up a whole bunch of topics right there with the sidewalk, the, the debris and all that. Um, I think that falls 
like you're saying, Joe, under sure. another code Correct. that just like you're bringing this forward, I would love to see that brought forward so mm -hmm. that we can address these items and... Right, and the only reason why, because it, and have it a falls on the on hedges and, and it falls on the walls and even though this is for something totally different, but I know that we had a client here on Deltona Boulevard who mm -hmm. was forced to push shrubs and everything in front of their business before they can open and then close their dumpster. And if you pass through there, it's a beautiful site. Right. And they just opened up. So I'm just, that's the reason why I felt like, you yeah. know, I should bring it up on this case. Yeah. And that's something as Commissioner Bradford said that we can workshop. Um, sure, absolutely. On a separate, yeah. Thank you. No Commissioner McCool and Commissioner Jody Lee. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, when it's proper, I would like this clarified, but we do have a resident that I have met with that is here tonight regarding opacity on their fence. It's just convoluted, so I would like them walk, Joe, you know who I'm talking about, we met, so I want that clarified in public. Second of all, I want to find out, <clears throat> is it a state requirement that we may not have residential fences more than six foot high? Because I can't find anything in state that says we can't, they can't have eight foot fences. Um, I don't, I don't, I can't tell you off the top of, the, off of my head that there's a state requirement for six feet. I know typically what that is, is from a pedestrian scale standpoint, it, it kind of creates more of a, a pedestrian scale design so that, um, you know, there's, there's, there's not um, structures that are up to the property line that are extremely tall. Yeah. On that question regarding the height, the Florida Building Code um, has provisions for fences over six foot height. There isn't a direction or a stipulation with the where, the winds, and the house. Okay, because if I want the famous Deltona hump that I am required to keep in my backyard because of the septic system elevates my property up so that really my fence is about three foot high. It's a six foot privacy fence. When I go up on that hump, in my backyard, I can see my neighbor's yard, they can see me in my backyard. It's horrible, right? My next thing is getting plants, planting bamboo back there or whatever, but I would like an eight foot fence along the back because my neighbors can see me. So I want to understand we allow commercial to have over six foot high fences. And I'm wondering why commercial base gets more leeway than a private residence. We are talking about private property rights. We're big on that here. We, you know, talk about and preach about developers' rights, you know, property rights. I want to talk about residential rights. If I want an eight foot fence, I want an eight foot fence. Second of all, I want cleared up that the, on a waterfront or golf course, Right. Okay. Well, I'm going to. I want to. I want to understand that about that. <laughs> no. Well, it was just for the the code yeah. for the fence requirement. Yes, and this this is this is the one that uh, gets I, th I think the most critique as far as from a residential standpoint. Could you take it away, Joe? Uh, so on the waterfront and golf course lots um, along the rear side and rear yards, um, you have to, if if you're going to have a full solid privacy fence, it can be no taller than four feet. Why? That um, I I don't recall the the total history as since I wasn't here when the last amendment to the code happened, but from um, from accounts from previous planning directors and planners in the city, when the ordinance review committee um, reviewed. Mr. Bowman, can you just keep it down just a little bit, please? When, when that got reviewed by the ordinance review committee, there was some back and forth as to how to address uh, waterfront and golf course fence uh, or lots as far as fencing. And I believe when it, when it came before the commission, it was limiting it to that four feet in that 2016 amendment that was done to the code. And so then that passed at that time because it was to preserve the vista um, from adjacent property owners and, pro and, and lands to be able to see the lake or the golf of course. That is what I understand is the history of that. So if I purchase property on a lakefront, I am looking out my vista right now. How does that preclude my neighbors from enjoying the vista from their viewpoint? I want privacy. I don't, I, you know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to understand this because it seems to be a problem. So not only that, you can't have mixed, mixed fence. You can't have privacy along the side, say that you want to comply, right? 
you cannot have a privacy fence to give you privacy and then have a iron fence to look out on the vista is that correct that is correct the materials section of it uh, section d of 110806 uh, says it has to be of uniform opacity um, very detailed. Um, it's a struggle because as David and I were conversating today, you know, if you have a lot where you want a privacy section of PVC and then you want a picket section of PVC, it looks all uniform because it's all the same materials. However, because it's not the same opacity, it does not meet the code. Listen, we, this is, uh, and I'm looking at here and most, I'm going to assume that most waterfront and golf course lots would be within an HOA. Am I wrong in that assumption? I said most, not all, but most. Um, not, not all. No, there's a lot of the. There's a lot of the Tona Lakes plats that are or platted lots that are uh, within just natural lakes within our city. Well, um, as far as the golf course, then yeah, you have the the RPUD of the golf course that's along Elkham. I would like this looked at also because I am very big on individual property rights. Right, individual property rights. Again, I would like to look at this, why? Because they did it back in the old day is not really good for me because um, it is, doesn't work with our residents that we have right now. We need to kind of be, we want a nice looking city. If people live on a lake or a golf course, they pretty much have the same consensus that they want to keep a nice property because they've invested. That property costs more, so they're more likely to be more invested. So I don't think that should be a thing. Right. Um, and, and part of the struggles that staff has had is how do you, how do you measure opacity? You know, it's not a requirement that you know somebody's saying, well, this is 35% opaque, and then this portion is 75. There, there's no real measurement to that. You know, it's it's really. These are all time-consuming measures that are ridiculous for our residents. Everything that everybody has talked about is time-consuming for staff and residents, and is very, very frustrating. So I would like to see that done away with. Let people put fences on their property if they're structurally sound, like we require, like the state requires, let them do what they would like to do. I understand putting the good side of the fence out. I get that, that's fine, I don't have a problem with that. But I'm sorry if you moved across the street from me and I live on a lakefront or a golf course and because I put a privacy fence up, you can no longer see. Then you should have invested in the property that sits directly on that. I don't want to give up my privacy because of your vista. You know what I'm saying? You've invested, let our people vista the way they want to vista. <laughs> so there's that, and I also would like to look into the, the six foot requirement. I want to understand that because I have talked to other people, I know I'm not crazy, other people would like, there are eight foot fences down in Venice, Florida. People have pools and they put up eight foot fences. They're fantastic looking. People have private gardens. It gives you a measure, another measure of privacy. We are so unequal in our terrain here in Deltona that six foot is really like the new four foot. So I would like us to discuss that also in residential. We protect commercial, we should be protecting residential the way that we do commercial and allowing people to enjoy their private, their, their property rights. So if we could just look into that, that would be fantastic. And that's all from me. Commissioner Jody Lee. Okay, Joe, I spoke to you earlier about this. Here's an easy one. I'll sum it up what everybody said. Can you take this whole fence thing and throw it away? Start over. Make it as simple as could be. You know, there's a thing in there about the, the corner lots. Your fence can't be, what, five foot or four foot, whatever it is. But if you go down Cortland Boulevard, all the houses that are on the end of the street, they'll have six foot fences. Yeah, and I, I will say. People that had fences prior to us being a city. I mean, it's so... Exactly. I mean, there's, yeah. there's just so much, and I'm sorry, just like Commissioner McCool just said about a lake. You can't have a stockade fence on the side of your house going to the end of the property to block the view of the lake for your neighbors or the people that live in front of you. No offense, but if you wanted to view the lake, you should have bought that house. That's not my problem. It's your property. It's your rights. Put your fence. And like Ms. Commissioner McCool said about the fence that's eight foot tall, I mean, that's fine if you have a six-foot fence. What happens if the guy that lives there is 6'4"? He can see right over your fence. I mean, what's wrong with an eight-foot fence? Not everybody's 
height restricted. <laughs> But, no, but if, if you could throw this thing right, I mean, start, just make it very simple. I got with, I can't remember the gentleman's name. He's the assistant to Cat in the office, the one that usually does the permits for the fencing or was doing it. He gave me some pointers and stuff on there. I mean, it, there, he's, there's all kinds of different parts that copy each other or can contradict each other in the ordinance. Just throw it out and start again. Very simple, very, it's your property, put a fence up. You know, I mean, I came not too long ago to the city, well, a couple years ago now, and tried to replace two panels because the storm blew it down. I had to get a permit, a new survey of my property. I was just replacing two panels that fell. I mean, it, we need to make it, we don't need to always try to get money to fix a fence either. I mean, this whole permit, every cost and everybody permits for everything. I mean, you want to breathe in Deltona, now you have to get a permit. We need to stop and make it very simple, cut and dry, and it doesn't always have to be about the money. That's it. All right, I'm gonna bring some stuff up and then I'll go to uh, Vice Mayor Bradford and then Commissioner McCool. So, do you have this in front of you, Joe? I think it's what we got, it just says the ordinance number. Um, I do not have that attachment. No. Okay, just, if, if you can just take some notes. So in section 110.806 incision, or subsection E1, it talks about four feet. And then if we continue to go to section G1, it also talks about four feet in height. So if it's five feet, I mean, unless we go the route, which I actually agree with Commissioner Jody Leon, and just scrap the whole thing and start from scratch to simpl simplify things, um, we, we need to kind of go through this and, and literally uh, fix some of the problems. Mr. Chisholm, would, would you think it would be, um, you think that's something that's more doable? We just get the fence ordinance, walls, hedges, and kind of go through it, redo it, um, not only redo it, but also put some section in there for emergency cases, right? Right. Um, I think that's gonna save a lot of, to Vice Mayor's point as well, it's gonna save a lot of staff time and headaches. Um, and I believe Commissioner uh, McCool brought it up as well. Just get rid of it and start all over again. Yeah. Um, I, I can certainly agree that there, are, it's kind of an overkill in many ways if you read this thing. And uh, so I think there's a great opportunity to change, to make those changes easy. Do we know, Joe, if uh, St. John's is, for example, I know if you're, in, in some water areas, St. John's, uh, cause I've seen some, <laughs> some of our residents have called me complaining that they're being fined because they need to purchase, uh, I forgot what they're called now, but there's some type of credits or something to remove some of the, uh, some of the, the bushes and stuff from the back by their waterways. There may be some that are protected, I don't know. Well, it may be within wetlands. Yeah, maybe a wetland, a wetland buffer. That so could, can we figure that out as well? Because I don't want us to start doing that and then St. John's is sending residents uh, mitigation stuff and saying, hey, you guys are gonna get fined for this as well, so. And, uh, and if I may, Mayor, this uh, section here, or this ordinance here that was attached, um, I'm looking at my uh, mini code version of the code and it actually E1 actually says five feet. E, well, then I guess I got an outdated one. Because it says front yard fences, walls, hedges, no higher than four feet may be erected. Yeah, our, our current code says five feet. Okay. Now, the diagram was never corrected. The diagram is incorrect. Okay, what about G1? Because that one also says up to four feet in height. Are you on ordinance 092015? Yeah, my mini code, uh, my uh, land development code here says ordinance number 09, uh, 2015, and the date um, adopted is uh, May 16th, 2016. There's another one. Yeah, we got 110-806. Yeah, I'm in section 110-806, but the latest version of our land development code. How about take them both and scrap them and start over with very small? <laughs> they're, they're very similar. I'm just clarifying that, yeah, that our code I mean? currently does say five feet. I mean, you have two of them. That's, and you, how do you think that makes us feel? You have two of them. That means the people in the city are reading two of them. It's just confusing as yeah. all get them. Well, the one, I know, the one that we're enforcing is this one. But. Okay, so let's just, Mr. Chisholm, you have obviously yeah. the direction you need, but. Mr. Mayor, why don't we, we'll, um, 
all these things can be changed. The very things you talked about are reasonable changes that can be made. It's nothing, I don't know of any law that says you can't have an eight, eight foot fence. I don't know of any law that says, says you can't, uh, you know, fix the fence except us. We make these laws. Sure. These are some commission here decide this is what they wanted. But uh, quite, I think the one that's kind of ridiculous is somebody's fence is up, wind blows it down or knocks it down, you gotta get surveyed to put it back up. That, that is just hard for me to even understand. Yeah, I mean, there ought to be some provision in, I mean, I understand what, uh, the reason they want surveys in most of these places is so that you don't have somebody encroaching on somebody else's property. And I've been in cities where houses were built on the road because they didn't have a survey. And so there's logical reasons to have surveys in many cases. And, uh, but when you have a fence that's been there a while, I guarantee if your fence was on my property and I thought you were encroaching, I'd be out there getting it moved, either legally or, or through the commission or whatever. But um, if there was an existing fence, more than likely it somehow they found the property line and they had the fence set up. Um, so I, I think there's some common sense that's missing in some of this stuff here. Perfect. But I think we can come back with some changes and see, uh, see if that's what you want. If it is, then we'll go through the process if, to get the code if, changed. If we can make sure we include, uh, if we can make sure to include some type of an emergency provision. Yes. Because we live in Florida, we're gonna get hurricanes. Right. Um, that would be grateful, I'll come back right. to you. Uh, Vice Mayor Bradford, Commissioner McCool, and then Commissioner Jody Lee. Okay, I'm just gonna make a joke. If we put up eight foot fences, are the deputies gonna be allowed to jump them? Are they gonna be able to jump them? I mean, come on, we gotta think about safety. We have a deputy here if you want. <laughs> are you jumping fences? I, I'm just saying, if we put up eight foot fences, how's the deputies gonna be able to jump these? I don't know. Our so I actually just sat here and went through. We got one in a can. No. Well, and, and let me. Let me I mean, I'd I like to make sure. But no, seriously, and I'm saying that because of this. So as I'm sitting here listening to everybody, I just did a quick search on surrounding cities, states, and a lot. And a lot of them do have eight foot. But then you get down to where it's like some that are very detailed and basing it off of certain codes. You know, we've got one that's saying, hey, listen, we can do X, Y, Z, but we're basing it off of the International Building Code, International file, Fire Codes, and, you know, and we have to think of that as well. So we do, all joking aside, we do have to think of, these guys do have to sometimes get over these fences. The fire department, what is their strategy? Um, why did they require to be able to see the lakes? I mean, are there reasons behind the madness? And if there are, I don't have a problem with it, but I would just like to know the reference to. I did not see any, and anyone, even Californian out there where they probably need or higher fences, higher than eight foot. But a lot of them did reference that we are going back and we're making sure that it corresponds with all of the state and federal codes. And that's the number one thing that I would like us to see adhere to. And let's look at these codes before we just say, you know what, I don't like it, let's change it. I just wanna make sure there wasn't a reason that it was put into play before we make those changes. And I'm guessing our wonderful new building official, he's gonna be right on that, working with you, Joe, I have utmost confidence. And I wanna say this about staff. About what? Staff. That staff in there has been amazing. They have been hit. I can't tell you with every obstacle, rebuild, repair that you could think of. I mean, we think of right now flood, 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 flood. But what we don't think about is the effects of the flood and the permits that our building department has gone through. And we're talking fences, you're talking roofs, you're talking drywall, you're talking, it's, it's crazy. So with that, you are walking into one of the most amazing staff in your building department that I have ever seen. That staff in that department, it's gone 360. 
I mean, when I was here a few years ago, it went from who are you and who cares to how can we help you and let me find out. So all kudos, I'm up here complaining about this fence ordinance. I don't want you guys to construe any of this against that staff because they have been amazing. And I'm gonna end it on that. And if I may, just to, just as something to think about regarding the fence heights, typically when you have your setbacks and you have height requirements, typically those are in line with the setbacks. Um, our typical Deltona R1 zoning uh, requirements require a six foot side yard setback. So if the fence is, let's say it's an eight foot fence on their side yard and it falls over, it may cause damages to windows and things like that in the event that it does fall over. So it's just, again, I'm just presenting what, what may happen in the event that if it's, if it's tall. It's not, I'm not saying that we can't consider it, but it's just something to think about. Commissioner McCool, then Commissioner Jodily, and then we'll go to public comments. Well, first of all, I think that DCSO has recruited some fine deputies <laughs> that are in the best physical shape of any law enforcement agency in the state of Florida. So I have all confidence that Volusia County deputies can scale eight foot fences. It's <laughs> FHP I'm worried about. <laughs> <laughs> so that, um, I wanna say too, that in reflecting upon that, as far as the emergency goes, I think that it should be, um, the permits should come, or the surveys and the permitting following that should come through as an exception and not the rule. Meaning this, if somebody needs to replace five panels on their fences, let them replace it without the permit. If there comes time that the neighbors are disputing about that, then perhaps a, or ordering a survey would be in order, right? But that would be the exception and not the rule. Again, trying to free up, the amount of bureaucracy that is involved in permitting and zoning in this town and most is incredible. It is frustrating, I'm sure, for staff that can move forward building our city better. We have a lot of antiquated ordinances. You see two of them here, meaning almost the same thing. And as we go through, and as staff goes through, I have all confidence to bring that forth to the city manager, to bring forth to the commission. You guys read that. I mean, I love our ordinance and code book. I'm a nerd like that. I read this stuff and our comp plan, but not everyone does. So when you see those things, I would like to encourage you we believe you a capable staff because we believe in our city manager and our city manager has done well at bringing capable staff in and take ownership of this as you see necessary changes. Please bring it to us. Duplicity is suffocating, you know, and we have a lot of that in our city when it comes to some of these ordinances. So again, please let that come through as uh, the you know what I mean, the exception and not the rule uh, and, and redoing this. Um, and I think that it would be well served residents and staff as well. Thank you, Commissioner Jody Lee. I guess I won't repeat Commissioner McCool again, but you know, the, like I said, if you just take both of the fence ordinances you have, all of it, throw it away, start it, make it simple. Now, I understand if somebody wants to put you know, a six foot stockade fence in their front yard, I get it. There's got to be a little common sense with it, but you know, there's, you know, all the different rules you see it, and people trying to get fences now. It says four foot or five feet on their side. Most fence companies, if you're getting panel fence or something like that, it's usually four foot or six. Mm -hmm. I think that's why they might have come up with a five at one point, because most fence companies don't make five foot. And it's and it's usually an extra cost to so the. It's, guess what? That's the just consumer. a way to defeat the people and. We just need to make it real simple. It's your property, you bought it. You don't want people looking in your backyard? Don't look and put a bigger fence up. I mean, we should allow people that you bought the property. The government is not supposed to make your life harder. It's supposed to make it easier. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chisholm, could we also look at possibly, do we need to have those ordinances in both building and in, in planning? Can we just not have it in one department versus two? The references ought to be together. and. And that's, uh, I don't know what happened with this one. That should be, I mean, we shouldn't have a separate code for one or the other. It ought to be one. Okay. Can we, do we have any public comment? No, Mayor. Okay. 
You say there was a gentleman here, Commissioner McCool? Does yeah, he if he, because we met with him, if he would like to speak, did you sign, did, did he sign up, did you sign up to, to, did you sign up to speak on your personal matter? Would you like to speak on your personal matter just to let the commissioners know? Because we did have a great conversation and it might be helpful to hear if you're comfortable from a resident standpoint, if you could come up and, and just kind of share what we talked about. That's totally up to you. Two minutes, if you would like. <clears throat> Just state your name and Jason Reeb. Uh, moved to Deltona three years ago, purchased the property on water. Fence has been there since I've moved in and looks like it's been there for a whole lot longer. <laughs> um, we were looking to try and do some things on the property. Replacing the fence was one of those. Um, I was down here at City Hall for another matter, decided to check into the planning department, permitting, got some great information from the folks down there. Uh, a young man helped me out, gave me lots of great information, and it was the most current. <laughs> um, as we started to look at it and review it, it became very clear that the information posed in here is very convoluted, very difficult to understand, and basically what I walked away with is I had to provide a fence for everybody that drove down the street to be able to see the water. And that was very disheartening. You know, why do I have to provide a fence for everybody driving down the street to see me in the backyard having a barbecue and playing cornhole with my family and friends when anybody across the street can have a six foot privacy fence or taller and run around their backyard naked, nobody'd ever know. So, yeah, I would love to see some revisions to this <laughs> and have some provisions made for folks that are on the water. The lake I live on, there's probably 20 houses. It's a private lake. There's no public access to it. Everybody that's on that lake bought that property because that's what they wanted. I mean, you know, the house sat, the house I purchased was up for sale for quite a period of time. So lots of people could have purchased it, thank but you. I bought it. So thank you. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and move on. I just want to take a minute to thank staff for their time. You guys are always doing a great job. So um, hopefully we can make your work a lot more simple. So. Let's uh, move forward to discussion regarding Chapter 14, Animals, Article 8, Section 14, 281-284, requested by Commissioner McCool. Chickens are important, so don't play. Um, <clears throat> I've had residents reach out to me, I'll start. I've had re residents reach out to me regarding this. <clears throat> there is a movement in Deltona, I don't know if you're aware, we have a beautiful community garden, thank you Deltona Strong, um, and Paula and Jim Pesha, the godmother and godfather of all things organic and wonderful in our community. We need leaders like this. First of all, people are moving towards eating in a more organic manner. People are looking at being more self-sustainable for financial and for environmental reasons. And we must acknowledge and embrace that in Deltona. We've talked about that. We, uh, we've tried to find alternates to recycling. We have a lot of gardeners in Deltona. There's a whole club. There are a lot of gardening community. And I've been to a couple of residents um, that have chickens. And now we have people with larger lots sizes, half an acre, that have shown me these working residents and <clears throat> where they are making huge gardens to become self-sustainable. And then looking at the practicality of having chickens, we have five chickens, um, I don't know how we came up with that number, but no roosters, that's fine, uh, in, the, in the area. But it has become a part of sustainability and um, um, we talked about this, I met with the city manager, met with planning, I met with legal about it, um, building, 
and we talked about that um, 15 chickens is a good amount of chickens to have for people to have eggs for the, the chickens to become organic pest control, for them to become organic fertilizer. And <clears throat> again, we are talking about individual property rights um, and people that I have talked to after the fact, because I have talked to people, not a single person that I have talked to, not a single resident has a problem with their neighbor having chickens. You literally have to be in the chicken coop to smell poo, especially if they are working in the yard. In our ordinance for stray animals, we already have something that talks about stray animals, so I don't know that we have to be pointed at chickens. I do laugh thinking about our animal control trying to run and catch chickens, and I understand where this will go, but the people that want to be sustainable, the people that are working hard, uh, they invest in this livestock and they take very good care of, of the coops, they take care of their gardens, and I just think that there is not a reason why they should be allowed to keep a healthy stock of this given the size of the property um, so Joe if you have if you can speak to this in the way that we spoke to it yep and uh, so as Commissioner McCool had stated uh, we had met uh, myself um, Suzette uh, city manager um, Mr. Jim Pesha, uh, his wife, uh, regarding the chickens. Um, so what we have before you here, the strike through uh, underlined format is uh, essentially what was what was uh, part of that meeting um, in our discussion um, to uh, try to amend the, um, the provisions to the chicken permit, um, part of section 14.281 and section 14.282 um, for larger lots, larger than your typical Deltona lots to provide for more chickens um, on that lot based on the size. So almost an incremental increase based on the lot size. There are also some other changes uh, that were that were implemented to make it um, a little more flexible as far as the accessory structure codes, um, as well as the screening requirements for the coops um, slash enclosures. Uh, so what's presented before you here is, is kind of a, um, what came of that, that meeting as far as uh, what was being requested for the chicken ordinance. Yeah, that. and I would like it, um, I don't know if uh, it's going to be spoken about, but there was, <coughs> someone had a concern regarding the structure of a chicken coop on a property, but yet the shed and the chicken coop liabilities were different or whatever. So I just want that spoken to. Um, I am, I am for this. I believe that with the way the economy is today, that people need a way to feel secure uh, in providing for their families. I don't see it as harmful to our community. And again, I've not spoken to anyone because I asked them without prejudicing or caveating the statement, what do they think? And people say, I don't care, as long as I don't hear a rooster crowing. So at half an acre or larger for this increase, um, I, I just would ask the commission to, to think about this. If you look, um, this is not for commercial. Um, there, there are some points that we talked about um, that have been stricken through, right, and, yes. and, and rewritten. And um, while the city manager might laugh, he agreed, you know, uh, and got this moving forward. So um, go for it. Commissioner Jody Lee, Vice Mayor Bradford, and then Commissioner Villa Vasquez. Before you even say anything. <laughs> I mean, I have an emotional support rooster. Okay. Is it better? I thought you were going to say something a little more fresh. I was, but I changed my mind. Thank you, <laughs> Commissioner Jody Lee. <laughs> you know, you know, Commissioner McCool. I'm, I'm, I really on this. I think it's kind of funny that we've <laughs> sitting here discussing chickens. We live in a bird sanctuary city, and we're discussing birds. But we have the largest money spent on TNR program with, of sanctuary city for birds. I ain't figured this out yet. But why do we have to make people pay money to have chickens? Why do you need a <laughs> permit to have a chicken? Come on. Is that all it's about, is making people pay money for everything? 
I have hamsters, fish. I have to get a permit for hamsters and fish and a koi pond and I have a cat. No, that's right, I have to register a cat, I have a registered dog. But every animal, you, it's, why does everything in our city have to be about someone has to pay to have it? You want chickens? Have chickens. I don't care. You want to eat them? Eat them. No roosters, please. But, I mean, I'm, I'm all about it. You want chickens? I don't care. Have your chickens. Clean them up. They get nasty. Code enforcement comes by after about the second time. I think you should lose all your chickens if you keep them cleaned up. But why do we have to make people pay to have them? Okay, live here, cost money, buy your house, pay your taxes, pay this, pay that, pay that. It's always about money. Why do we have to be about money on everything somebody in this city wants to do? Well, that's it. Vice Mayor Bradford, then Commissioner Avila Vasquez. All right, so let me answer that. And that's gonna be an unfortunate. I'm, I'm gonna tell you, it's the ones who abuse it that you have to make laws for. That's why, unfortunately, we don't always have the wonderful Paches who have a golden rooster farm. Their, their roosters are probably spoiled worse than my dog. Or not the roosters, they're chickens. No roosters, chickens. Um, but not everybody's like that. Not everybody has that cleanliness. Not everybody is going to do that. So because of them, we have to make sure that we protect the neighbors that live beside them. That's why, unfortunately. So a couple things come to my mind, and I'm sorry, I'm always the one that has to think it out past the ones, like, again, that take it advantage of something that we we give. Um, and I'm saying this because I drove down 415 the other day and I saw eggs for sale, eggs for sale, eggs for sale. Who's regulating that? So if somebody wants to sell their eggs, do they need to get a BTR? Are they required to do anything? What happens if that person gets sick? We just said it's allowed. You're allowed to sell those eggs. Oh, I'm sorry, you got sick, you can't sue me. Go sue the city, they allowed us to do this. I wanna know liability reasons and do we need to put anything in here that says they are not allowed for resale? So per the existing, I did I miss that in here? Per the existing ordinance, uh, section five, um, 281, um, number five, uh, the current ordinance says uh, it's for personal use only, selling chickens, eggs, or chicken manure, or the breeding of chickens is prohibited. That's crossed out. Correct. That so is that being, means that you're proposed. eliminating that. Right. So the new ordinance is not gonna have it. Correct. And It'll I'm gonna have to disagree with that portion of it because again, it's not the ones that do what they're supposed to do. It's the ones who are gonna say, oh, 15 chickens, I can do this and I can sell a few dozen a week for 20 bucks, a, a dozen right now, they're, they're gold, um, and make some money on this. So, I, I hate to say it, I mean, I don't have a problem with the 15 chickens, I don't have a problem with the regulating to making sure that they're staying clean because we do have an obligation to keep the neighborhoods clean. Um, what I don't wanna see is I don't wanna see us going down the road and seeing you know, chicken signs all down the roads. Mm -hmm. And, and it, so I would like to see um, selling of chicken eggs or chicken manure or the breeding of chickens is prohibited. We don't allow breeding of cats. We don't allow breeding of dogs. That's all illegal, as I recall, in Deltona. So that's another topic that we've been discussing internally. There are provisions in our code for the breeding of it with proper permitting. Um, so there is there is a provision in our in our code of ordinances that does allow for hobby breeding of dogs. Then that person would be required to have a BTR. Correct. So that again takes me, if somebody's breeding, somebody's selling, somebody's selling eggs, they're taking themselves out of the personal backyard for personal use to a business. So this isn't, these are two different beasts. If we want to allow it for the personal use, my personal family, friends, blah, 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 it's different. Mm -hmm. Taking this out is a huge mistake. We're opening the door to like have at it. So I personally would like to see number five remain, and if so, um, just require and I BTR. guess if you just put that in there, that's gonna eliminate pretty much the need to say, hey, you, 
Do you want a BTR test? Well, it says number five. It says selling, it says chicken associated activities shall be kept to personal use only. And then it goes to saying selling chicken, chickens, eggs, or chicken manure, or the breeding of chickens is prohibited. I believe that whole paragraph needs to remain. Okay. Yes. I, I'm just, I'm just concerned with the, the abuse of, of that. And again, Mr. and Mrs. Pesce, you've made a lot of people happy by even starting this years back. <laughs> um, you know, thank you. Thank you guys for always being an advocate and, and helping out on this. I do appreciate all your input. That was my biggest concern. Thank you. Understood. Commissioner Vila Vasquez. Thank you, Mayor. I remember when this ordinance came up, um, forget how many years ago I was sitting up there, this room was packed with people who were complaining about chickens. They did not want their chickens or chickens in their neighbor, in the neighbor's yard or their yard. One, no matter how much you enclose it, they still smell and it travels to your neighbors. The other thing was not, not too long ago, I heard somebody saying to the other person, we're gonna do fresh chicken kill. Come over the house at this time. Oh. So here again, <laughs> we have these rules, but there's people out there who's using it for commercial. You know, I, my grandmother killed the chickens in her own house, but those are different days. So they are killing chickens and selling them from their house. Mm -hmm. I can tell you because I know. Um, the neighbors complain about the noises of the chickens. There are diseases. My friend owns many acres in Orange City. And there was a disease going around that they caught themselves and had to fumigate the whole entire pigs, the cows, and everything. And recently there was some article about the, the uh, bird flu or something, some telling uh, residents to stay away from pigeons and birds and stuff like that. I don't have a problem with these things. I'm just telling you what neighbors came here to complain about, and that's why this was put together. Um, and I'm gonna tell you that you can put this through, but we're gonna have a lot of people come here again and complain. Because people moved into a, an area to have a home for their families to have functions, not for my neighbor's chickens to run away and wind up in my property, um, you know, with all their, their stuff around my block, my, uh, but, you know, we'll see what, the, what is voted on here and stuff like that, but I'm telling you, we're gonna have a lot of complaints from a lot of residents who don't want chickens in their neighbor's house or their neighbor's property. Because this is why this um, uh, rules were put in. I was sitting out there when it, when everyone was here complaining about it. So uh, I, I, I wanna make a couple comments. Um, I think 15 chickens is a lot of chickens. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna bring up a street, Blue, Hori Blue Horizon, I believe if I'm not mistaken. They know that they, they've gone away from a chicken issue, they now have a bunny problem. I mean, I'm sure Code knows all about it, and I'm sure they have a lot of fun trying to catch them. They, they're all over the place, right? Um, I had a long conversation uh, not too long ago with the mayor of Oviedo. Um, as a matter of fact, it was a running joke because I, I went there to visit a friend, and I was parked in front of a church's chicken, and there was chickens outside of the tour. I mean, I don't know if there were out there to get, you know, cooked, whatever, you know, it was, it was funny at the time. But my fear, right, is we, 50, again, 15 chickens is a lot of chickens. You have one person or two people trying to handle all these chickens. What happens when they start getting away from people? Or like in the case of the street I mentioned, somebody that was raising bunnies then found out they weren't allowed to be selling bunnies, they just let them loose and now there's a issue with bunnies all over that street in our city. Are we, are we okay and ready to say, you know what, if we're gonna have chickens running around, uh, are we gonna be okay with that? I don't mind increasing the amount of chickens, right? But be prepared for when somebody wants duck eggs or geese eggs 
or whatever it is that they come and bring, let's get ready for, for what else comes with that. Or when somebody with a lot of dogs says, well, why can't dogs be accepted? I'm just saying that everything we do has a cause and effect. I'm not trying to upset anyone, but let's think things through. 15 chickens is a lot of chickens. Unless you have acreage or, or a big property, it's a lot of chickens. That's all I'm gonna say. Commissioner McCool, then Jody Lee, and then Vice Mayor Bradford. Thank you. <coughs> We have one commissioner per 14,000 people, and a lot of people would say the same thing about us trying to control people, so I'm just gonna We're put that chickens. out there. We're not chicken. Listen, <laughs> to a professional, if somebody does this, and when I say professionally, this is their lifestyle, they're conservationist, they are self-sustaining. Um, their grasp on chickens is way better than ours. To us, it looks like a lot of chickens, but in a working situation, it is not. 15 chickens are not a lot of chickens to manage. I've had that discussion, so there's that. <laughs> Second of all, loose chickens. We have ordinances in place for that, and we also have, let's, we wanna talk about that. Let's talk about the cats we have still failed to monitor in the city. Let's talk about the stray dogs that we failed to monitor. We're always going to have strays, no matter what, that we have to monitor, period. So there's that. Also, I am all for putting five in there for personal use only, selling chicken eggs or chicken manure, the breeding of chickens, and there's also a section in here, there's no ducks or any PV fowl or anything like that. It's spelled out in here. Anything else violates code, much like the, the restrictions we have on any other code. So there's that. When you talk about selling or whatever, here's what's gonna happen. Right now it happens. I'm gonna give you eggs, but I will accept a donation. So legally, I'm not selling eggs. There's always a, round, a way around something. We have pharmacies for controlled substances, but yet we sell them on the street also. So where there's a will, there's a way, and it's going to be that way right here. And you're right, bad people mess it up for good people. But we have to quit punishing the good people for what the bad people are doing. This is a sustainable way of life, and Deltona is not the Deltona that used to be. We're trying to be progressive. We are trying to provide our residents a way to support and sustain themselves. You know, and <clears throat> there are people that don't like the certain flowers that other people plant in their yards. They don't like the noise next door. There's always gonna be complainers. So fill up the dais. People, come and speak your mind. That's what we have these open chairs for. If a bunch of people wanna come and try to eviscerate people that are simply trying to provide for themselves. I think it a little bit elitist myself, and I'm just gonna say that because we are in a new economy, we are in a new way of trying to take care of ourselves and provide organic food for ourselves. Chicken slaughtering is covered in here. If somebody's saying that, they're doing it for religious or cultural reasons, that needs to be addressed, not people that are trying to catch chickens. I'm gonna, or raise chickens, so I'm gonna put that out there. <laughs> so, there is a con to everything, we must explore that. And Vice Mayor, I am with you on that to keep that in that language in there so that it is very succinct uh, to have that in there. We also need to keep the permits. The permits, much like everything else, are not meant to be punitive and restrictive. What it does is it ensures the safety of the animal to make sure that whoever is applying to keep this, these animals, this livestock, that they are prepared to do so in a responsible manner. And you know what, here's the thing, we have complaints for everything else. You know, stop punishing good people for the few bad eggs. We have to quit thinking that way, you know. So chicken power, 15's a dead blame good number for me. Let the professionals handle that and uh, let's encourage people to grow, grow, grow. Thank you. Commissioner Jody Lee, then Vice Mayor Bradford. Uh, Vice Mayor, I agree. We need to keep that one paragraph in there. I'm still set, I don't know, I just don't want to agree on the permit thing. I mean, we have, <laughs> you're talking about loose chickens running around town. We spending over a hundred grand a year out of our city money for cats. I think it'd be really easy to take care of the loose chickens. Just saying, I mean. <laughs> 
uh, we're, I mean, if we're talking about problem animals, are we going to start barring cats from being in our city? I know I shouldn't say that because the cat people in this city are going to just lambaste me for this. But, I mean, we spent a bunch of money on cats, and we're worried about some people having chickens. Like I said, we, we could put a code in there where somebody, if they get one or two complaints, then they lose their chickens. If they're not keeping them clean, I get it. I mean, I, I totally understand that. But to tell someone you can't do it, I mean... I'm just worried the next person's going to come to the city and want to raise turkeys or something. But I think we raise enough turkeys, so it's all good. Vice Mayor Bradford. Okay. Great valid points up here. Mayor, good point on the 15 chickens. I, I really... So, what happens to all those cute little kittens when mama can't find a home. We got a whole bunch of cute feral kittens. Have you ever been to Puerto Rico? How many chickens did you see running around while you were on vacation, right? Okay, so I kinda, I, 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 I've actually been to these cities and I can almost visualize this. How many eggs a day does a chicken lay? Mr. One. Pasha. Okay, so, I have a family of, well, let's just go, I'm gonna reverse this. A chicken lays one egg a day. Sometimes the chicken's not gonna, the hen's not gonna lay an egg a day. So we're gonna say, let's out of those 15 eggs, that family now has 10 eggs, 10. Let's say that's 70 eggs a week. Please tell me, well, I mean, you've got it. You're, you, that person's going to have some high cholesterol. I mean, we, we're going to need Halifax in here, okay? And I'm putting a joke on this, but in all reality, for personal use, that's a lot. And if somebody wants to have 15 eggs, that's almost like an agriculture. That's not, I moved in, and we do unfortunately have to look at that. You know, we are a dominant residential home. We don't have that many half acre lots. Um, somebody who's gonna have 15 eggs, I'm gonna tell you they're gonna be selling those babies. And if they're not gonna be selling them, you're gonna have rotten eggs sitting in a coop. And if you don't have rotten eggs sitting in a coop, and you know, you guys know that, that the animals are gonna come get those eggs. You're gonna be drawing raccoons. You're gonna be drawing the animals that are gonna be getting those. You know, so the only thing I can think you're doing with 70 eggs is you're selling them. Um, that's, that's a lot. And that's being conservative that five hens a day aren't laying. You know, so I think the 15 might be, after going through this and listening to everybody, might be a little bit much. What I do get concerned with is the ones that do hatch and now their 15 chickens went to 20 chickens. Um, I, I see this transpiring fast. You know, if they want to have an agriculture permit, I do not have a problem with 15 chickens on an agriculture. Um, but on a half acre residential lot, I'm, I'm going to think we need to revamp that. I would probably be even okay with 10, but even that I think is high if we're using these for personal use. So I don't know how set we are on this 15 number, but you know, I think we really need to look at it. Do you want your neighbor, and your, let's just say your neighbor's not the cleanliest person, having 15 chickens, they go and they gather the eggs they need for that day, the rest of them sit there, and then look what you've got in your backyard. But they don't just go in your backyard. They're gonna be going through your backyard to get to that backyard. So these are, you know, and I, and I know it's like, don't punish the good ones, but unfortunately we have to protect all of our own homeowners, not just a few of our homeowners. So I think we can, we should come up with a number um, that's a little bit better for a half acre yacht. How big is a half acre lot? Can you give them a perspective of how big a half acre lot is? Like a pitch, you know, you know, because some people, when you say a half acre lot, they're like, that's huge. A half acre lot is really not that big when you put a shed and all that on it. Vice Mayor, if uh, to Jody's point, I believe the majority are even quarter acre lots. The majority. Yeah, right. so Most of our homes so are quarter small. acre, so put two of those lots together, put a larger house, put the fence, put the shed, put anything else they have back there, throw in 15 chickens, 
Like I say, and this, this is about 70 eggs. This is almost six dozen eggs a week. Who goes through six dozen eggs a week? Other than your next patient for Halifax. That's a lot. If the commission would allow me, I would like Please. to hear Mr. 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 Pesha come up here and maybe he can give us a better idea of how many, how many hens or chickens. And, and just to bring up another point, I don't know if you guys know this, tra Tractor Supply Store has sold chickens, to, I've got these calls, that turn out to be roosters, and since they can't kill the roosters, the residents have told me in confidence that they have just let them loose. So, Mr. Well, Pache. And, and that's my concern. Mr. Pache, like I said, when I say, I, when I say you have the golden yard, I'm saying that in a very positive way. I mean, if, if I came back as a chicken, I'd want to be in your yard. I mean, you, you guys are amazing the way you keep your home, you keep your yard, and you keep your garden. So I will say that. Yeah. So you're the exception to the rule. Well, thank you for the compliment. But I don't think I'm the only one that lives this way. I have several friends that do also have chickens. And from what I have seen, and I think you can even go back uh, a couple of years ago, when code enforcement came out to look at the coops when we were first getting the permits, the comment came back to the city and to Mayor John at the time that those crazy chicken peoples build Taj Mahals for their chickens. We care about our animals. Why? Because they're making me breakfast. And if I'm going to take something and put it in my mouth, I'm going to take damn good care of them. Sorry for the language. But that's the way our people are thinking. We're taking care of ourselves, our health. Not only my health, but my wife's health. And when my grandchildren come over, my grandchildren's health. A chicken only lays one egg a day, but not every day. Somebody asked me what I would do as a rule of thumb. I would say one egg every other day. Your 15 chickens would probably be more or less, more likely give you seven to 10 eggs a day, but not every day. If I'm taking a look at that, that's only 50 or 60 eggs, like you see, a week. I have my grandchildren come over. My grandson, he's only 26, but he eats like a horse. He puts away four eggs. I only put away two or three. My wife puts away one or two. My daughter-in-law, she puts out a couple more eggs. There's my dozen eggs a day. It doesn't take long for them to go through a dozen eggs. Not when you have a larger family. My daughter and son-in-law have four children. That's six people in their family, plus me and my wife, that's eight. If we sit down to a breakfast, we go through a lot of eggs. You've stopped over and had it breakfast at my house. We had a nice scramble. We went through a half dozen eggs in a heartbeat. We have friends that stop over, and yes, I serve them breakfast. It seems to be the thing. They like my eggs. I don't know why. Maybe it's because it's really good, fresh eggs with no pesticides, no hormones, no nothing. So we take care of that. 15 eggs or hens in a backyard is not for everybody. That's why we ask to have it only on larger properties. As far as the concerns that the people brought up uh, 10 years ago, yes, they did come here. Yes, they did complain. And a lot of these restrictions that we're addressing today were put in 10 years ago because of the unknown. We didn't know. But what's happened is we've had this ordinance in place seven going on eight years. And when we look back over those years and check with cold enforcement, you'll find that there's been minimal, if any, major issues about chickens over all those years. One person told me Zero. that the chicken ordinance was one of the best ordinances the city had ever adopted because it was the least problematic that we've ever had to deal with through cold enforcement. Now, I have to admit, this was a couple of years ago. So, but we've gotten better. Like it's been pointed out, people are recognizing the value, not only in the food, but pest control and everything else. The concerns were brought up at the smell. 
The people who brought them up were exposed to chicken farms. Not five chickens, not 10 chickens, but 10,000 chickens. And yes, you can smell them down the road. Try going down to the kennel sometime and see what that smells like. It's the same thing. Go into a house where you have 100 people in one house, you have problems. Go into one when you have the right number of people, you don't have a problem. We're looking at control. I agree we need a code. Why? Because we have those exceptions that don't pay attention. I also agree that those that take care of them, take care of them well. We've seen people who love their dogs, love their cats. We love our chickens. I can't go out in the backyard without the chickens coming up to see me. I can't weed my garden without them sitting underneath my arm or in my lap trying to catch the worms and bugs that pop up. And they make me a fantastic breakfast that I share with my family and my friends. No, I'm not selling my eggs, but I have no problems with inviting my family over for dinner. And when my daughter's having a hard time making her ends meet, I reach in and I hand her a zucchini, a couple of cucumbers, and a dozen eggs. That's not selling them. That's helping family. And what's wrong with that? Yes, I may get five dozen eggs a week if I have 15 chickens. But it's not that many eggs when you look at the size of the families we have today. You take a look at our population. We have kids that don't have food. They go to school so they can eat. What's wrong with me giving them a dozen eggs or a zucchini? It makes a great omelet. Do you have any questions else I could answer for you? Vice Mayor, anything else? No, I don't have any questions, but I did have another one, not for you, Mr. Um, Pache, but I did have one on number six. Who is um, section 14-282? Um, it says persons granted a chicken permit will be encouraged to attend appropriate training session to learn safe chicken and egg practices. Where's this class at? Okay. Uh, is that an online class? Is that a class that we're going to have to have staff trained in? No, it's encouraged, not mandated. I mean, if we're going to encourage it, we need to have like, where are they taking this course at? I mean, because I think it is a good idea because there is a necessity to know how to take care of these. It's like, I'll give you an instance, my six-year-old granddaughter begging for a hamster, having no clue what it took to take care of the pet, what's required, how much work, how much labor, how much cleaning, how much food, what do I need to do? You know, kids get pets all the time. So I, I don't have a problem with this. I just want to know where is this class and how is this class being done? Um, so this is this was put together back in the 2016 ordinance. Um, I don't know if this what what has been done with that class or what has been followed up with that. Um, it wasn't struck through in the proposal, um, but I I could not tell you at this moment what class that is or where okay, that's Okay, here given. comes Miss Paula. She's got to know. I don't usually come up here, but here I am. Um, they are holding classes up at the Ag Center. It, from what I understand, and that was even advertised, what, a couple weeks ago or so, yeah. that they're having, having them again. Um, so people can sign up for them. Would you be interested sometimes in teaching people how to really take care of chickens? Would we be interested we need to in, use your microphone, in Jody? teaching them? Yeah. Sure, why not? Okay. <laughs> The library You're the just chicken had. King now, so I mean, no. no, the library just had a how-to festival this past weekend. Right, but would you be helpful to help people teach them how to raise chickens the right way? Would yes, you? I could do it on a periodic basis. It won't be a thing, but like I was saying, now the library had the how-to festival. I had held chicken classes during that in previous sessions prior to COVID. We have no problems helping out the community and passing on information. Perfect. You know. Thank you, Mr. Pesha. We're going to go to, I'm coming, we're coming to Commissioner Dana McCool and then we're going to go to public comment. Thank you very much. Could someone speak to me, anyone, about how many chicken permits do we have at current? Bueller. Anybody? Bueller.
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Commissioner Suzette Cameron. I work with your building and your code compliance divisions. Um, I do not have that number for you, but I will get that to Mr. Chisholm in the morning. Okay. We do, we do have some. I had provided uh, Joe from planning some of the complaints, and they were fairly minimum, but uh, I'll also provide that number to the city manager. That, and that was my next question. How many complaints in the last five years have we had about chickens? I have those pulled. Did you bring those, Joe, that I give you? Okay. Can, can, oh, I want to say they were around 25. It, it seemed like around 25 a year that code, code compliance would address. Okay. If you could get that, that would be fantastic. You'll have it in the morning. Um, and also, you know, I don't think that there's going to be a chicken rush here. We have people that are already in groups that um, have chickens and people, as Mr. Pesha so eloquently put, take care and want to take care of their animals. I don't necessarily think that people that have chickens are unclean. You know, I, I just don't. If there's a surplus, we have plenty of starving people made apparent by our food banks in our city, and we have plenty, we have lots of families living together and multi-generational, so I just don't, you know, I, I, I like getting to yes here. I don't think that 15 for um, somebody that wants to, that lives on a half acre lot is, is a lot, uh, but I do agree uh, again, and lastly, that we need to keep the section in there regarding permitting and regarding uh, personal use. There's always a surplus I I here, you know, it's just, I understand the, con I understand the concerns, right? Um, and I'm glad that we're talking about them openly. Um, but then again, I would like the numbers for, you know, at 25 in a year, that's what, two chicken complaints a month Correct. from 100,000 people. So really, I mean, let's do the chicken math on that, you know. So before I go to Vice Mayor Bradford, can we come to a consensus? Can, can we do some compromising, right? Can we get to 10 first? Because think about this logically, just because something is working, you're gonna now take it and completely change it triple it and say it's gonna still work, that, that doesn't always happen. So can we meet halfway? We can do 10 chickens, let me finish. We can do 10 chickens and then bring it back in two years. If we have not had an issue, then we can up, up, up it to 15. But just blatantly just going to 15, I think that's, a, that's just me, I'm one person, right? So Vice Mayor and then we can- uh, 11 chickens, no even numbered chickens. So 11 chickens, 13 <laughs> chickens. Always has to. That's so chicken math. We were, we were actually <laughs> saying most of our lots are currently a quarter acre. And if we're saying a half acre, which is times two, that would equal Nine, so if we don't want, if we don't want an even number, then we'll go nine. 11. <laughs> so, um, I'm good. In fact, I think 10 might be pushing it. Um, I mean, I'm okay with nine or 10. I think we're, th that, that nine or 10, Paula says 10. Paul is good with 10. All right, now this is what I would love and I hate to give staff any more work because I know you guys are just bored. Um, when you pull those 25 complaints, I can we can we show like a it's a duplicate for XYZ address, you know, that way we know like, hey, this is this one complaint has been on the same house. And you know, kind of statistics wise, out of the twenty five complaints of those are how many versus the number of permits pulled. So, you know, if we've got fifty permits pulled Thank you. If we have 50 permits pulled versus the 25 complaints, I would just, I want to be fair on this, um, but I'm going to take it from the best chef out there, and 10 is my final answer. <laughs> If anybody else wants to can, chime in. Can we, everybody would, I would love to hear everybody at least give me a number, please. So, because Mr. Chisholm's been listening for a while, so has staff, they, they need direction. So, oh, Dana, 10, we'll start with you because you're the good. most ancient. <laughs> Dana? 11, 11 chickens. So, we got two for 10 and one for 11. Commissioner Jody Lee? Yes, Commissioner Jody Lee. <laughs> <laughs> 
Could, yes. go, go ahead, um, half Commissioner acre or more. Half acre or more. Yes. For a half acre so or that more. That means most people in town won't be able to have a chicken. <laughs> No, no, quarter acre lots, we're saying quarter acre lots, 10 chickens. Oh, okay. Quarter acre lots, five, only a half acre and above. Five. See half what I mean there? Larger. Okay, at the same time, how many complaints has there been for cats? We're not restricting cats. I mean, come on. We, we could have a workshop on that later. We're not talking about cats. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of chickens, I'm hungry. So it's 10 chickens for every half acre. Five right. for a quarter, 10 for a half. 10 for a half acre. I feel like we're bargaining up here. Jody? I don't know. Dana's saying that uh, uh, even numbers, bad luck, so we should go to 11. Thank you. I don't. Commissioner Codwell? I can't believe we're spending this much time on chickens. Ten, 10 or 11? 10. Commissioner Avila Vasquez? I like to keep it the way it is. Okay, so we got three at 10, two at 11, and one leave it the same. So I believe you have your direction. Nine and a half. <laughs> <laughs> we want to leave it uneven. We got it. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Oh, we have public records, right? Yes. Public comment. Mayor, there are two public, public comments, comments on. on this item, Jim Pesha and Albert Bryant. Jim Pesha, please. Jim Pesha Deltona. Thank you for getting my wife to the podium finally. <laughs> if I'm going to make a compromise, I actually like the mayor's suggestion. Let's go with 10. I'll put again in a couple of years to see how things work out. Uh, we did that in the past because, like I said, a lot of unknowns. But now we've had some track record. I have no problems putting down another track record. I have faith in the people that have taken care of themselves. As far as the odd number, I personally like an even number. My chickens seem to pair up in pairs, literally. So let's not have an odd chicken running around lost by himself. So my vote's for 10 at the first try. So that's about all I have at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Albert Bryan, please. You know, for once, I actually agree with you, Jody. I couldn't believe you all spent so much time on this. Okay, two things. As far as the number, one, y'all are wrong. Most of the lots in Deltona are under a quarter acre. So think about that. But if you're already allowing five on less than a quarter acre, doesn't it make sense to at least allow 10, or even a baker's dozen, 13, on a half an acre? But then I also read in the ordinance that it says you don't have to have a permit for that chicken coop. You're building a chicken coop. You can build that thing 10 feet high if it's under 100 square feet at the bottom of it. You don't have to have a permit for it. But the city chooses to tell me that I have to have a permit for a shed of any size, any size. Whether it's one foot by one foot, if I call a shed, I have to come up and see permitting and have a permit for that. That means I gotta spend money to do that. I don't want you to tell these people that I gotta spend money to permit that coop, but I would like it inspected. Because if I gotta have my shed, or if I gotta have my fort for my kids, which I did have to do. I had to pull a permit for my fort for my kids. Well, he's talking about these being like his children. So if you're going to take and permit one, permit the other. You don't have to make them pay for it. Permit it. Have it inspected. Make sure it will take and hold a tornado or whatever we get here weather-wise. Because if my house gets hit by the chicken coop that's behind me, I'm coming to see you, not my neighbor, because you're allowing that. Thank you, Mr. Albert. And uh, just for clarification, I, I believe a lot of us have spoken about probably bringing sheds up for a workshop as well. So, Vice Mayor, and then we're going to move on. 
Albert, I'm pretty sure this covers it in this ordinance. It does state under the chicken permit, um, it's actually been changed from number seven to number six. It says the coop and enclosure must be located in the year in the rear yard as defined by the city's code and ordinances. So I'm assuming by, the, uh, and I was on, maybe I'm under assumption here, when it said as defined by the city's code and ordinances, that that meant that it had to be to code. So can we get that to be a little bit more clarified? Because if, if he missed it, 90% of people are gonna miss it because Albert's pretty much detailed. So is it in here somewhere? Did I miss it? Yeah, so the one you mentioned and then the next one, uh, the coop or enclosure must comply with standard accessory structure setbacks and requirements. So can we just, we, is, is there a possibility to put as defined by the city's code and ordinances as well and that it has to comply, you know, because I understand what he's saying. So we could have somebody who builds this Taj Mahal with chicken coops and then we're back to an eyesore on the neighbors. You know, I think it should be according to our shed or something. I'm gonna let y'all word it. That's yeah, really we'll, not we'll, our position, but we'll clarify let's make here. sure we don't have that Taj Mahal as they call it. Um, that would exceed that. So I do think that's a, a very valid point. Um, I guess I was just assuming by the city's code and ordinances that that meant it had to be within code. So um, let's make this kind of dummy proof here. We'll, we'll do so. Thank you. Okay. So we're moving down to uh, planning. Point of order for time, please. Um, to extend the time of the workshop, please. Okay. Can we... Uh, can Mayor, we get a I make motion? a motion to extend the time for 15 minutes. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Bradford to extend the time 15 minutes. Second. Second by Commissioner Dana McCool. All right. 7.30. Yeah, we go till 7.30. We're supposed to extend it. Can we, um, everyone's in agreement. Can you just say aye, please? Aye. aye. All right, Any, anyone as opposed say nay. Yeah. All right. Planning and Development Services Department and Building and Code Compliance Reports. I think your mic is off, Mr. Mayor. Apologize. Planning and Development Services Department and Building and Code Compliance Reports. Good evening again, Mr. Mayor, Commissioner Suzette Cameron, working with your building and code compliance divisions. Um, so in the building department, you have a, two staffs, basically. You have your front end staff that gets to encounter your customer that comes looking for that permit. And uh, there's a staff of eight of those that help with that. We have three that work your building permits and then three that work towards the uh, solid waste, animal control, and code enforcement complaints. As you can see, in 2020, you had 8,600 permits. 2021, 10,000 plus. 2022, 11,000. And as you can see, in 2023, uh, somewhere around 12,000. So the staff, is, as you guys did mention, do a great job. They do encounter a lot of um, things and questions that come up. So this conversation this evening is, is beautiful because it does help staff as we look at our codes and try to make them as easy and acceptable to understand to all, including staff. Um, Joe has made some great um, suggestions, which we've recently uh, uh, have put into place, and he'll bring that up, and that's dealing with our zoning and our zoning technician processes. But what I'd like to do here tonight is bring up our building official. He joined your team in April around the 10th, and he's going to come up and talk a little bit about the uh, permitting side and his staff. Uh, David Meyer, please. Again, thank you for having me here. The permits that were mentioned, pardon me, I'll check the slide. They generate roughly 26,000 inspections per year. 
we currently have a force with four building inspectors, a assistant building official, and myself, the building official, which we also assist with inspections and with plan review. There's a lot that goes into that, um, not just with that, but getting uh, a lot of these questions answered and resolving some of the things is a big part that takes uh, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of talent. And, you know, while we do have uh, some things going, I think there's a pretty good thing, but we have a little a few things we'll need to tweak as we go along. The process when you apply for a permit, you have submittal documents. Um, there are engineered plans, uh, might be truss engineering, window and door, that type of thing. But once, it, once it's received, the permit tech reviews all of that, it goes into zoning where they get approval for that. Um, the plan review and the inspection um, all rely on the Florida Building Code. These are examples of the books and the references that we have to apply both in plan review and in inspections. There's a little bit of a difference with those because in plan review, they usually go into a little more depth where where the inspection would be done, the decision is already made as to the code compliance, but the books are the same that we reference for those. Plan review is, is a, a, a difficult task um, and it gets a little backed up sometimes, but on that thing, we have a great staff that does a great job getting these things done because ultimately it's all about safety. Once it goes through the plan review process, the permit gets issued, all the inspections get approved, that's when a certificate of occupancy gets issued, and that's for a single family residence. Many of the permits that we deal with are not just for houses. There's a lot of things with repairs, water heater replacements, door and window replacements, repipes, uh, re-roofs. There's a number of things that, that go along um, on those lines. Part of the uh, licensing requirements by the state of Florida, Chapter 468 governs the licensing for building code administrators, plans examiners, and building inspectors. Um, and it does take uh, quite a bit of history that you have to have four years demonstrated or some equivalent in educational experience um, and once you get a license, it requires 14 hours of education, continuing education every two years. Um, that pretty much covers that. Does anybody have any questions? Vice Mayor Bradford and then Commissioner McCool. Couple questions, and you may not have these answers, and I understand, but if you can get me answers, that would be amazing. Walk-in permits versus online. Obviously, your walk-in time is significantly reduced than applying on lines. What are we doing to rectify that? Is there apps, is there software, is there something you guys need to speed this process along? That's a great question. Um, the walk-in is faster. I'm at four weeks on one walk-in. It was, hasn't even been looked at. We'll, we'll, we'll cover that. But I was told to walk it in, it would speed it up. So if a walk-in is at four weeks, I'm nervous to see what online is. And I'm, and I, your staff, it's nothing against the staff. Staff is doing as much as they can. So my question is, what resources do you need? Because I'm just a very small fish, right? But there's large fish out there that has gotta be inundating the staff. So I'd like to know what resources, what app additions, what do you guys need to speed this up, especially with that increase in number of permits being submitted? Right, the online process versus the walk-in. I know currently right now we're having some difficulty with online for a single family residence. Um, I don't know the actual source of that. I know that that is an issue. Um, I've been told that there's been problems with the with getting the plants. So where that problem lies, I haven't gotten to the bottom of that. But there's also a difference in that too. Um, with, I'm gonna use the example of a single family residence versus say a solar installation. A solar installation, the plan review is relatively 
quick. But a single family residence, there's a lot more items that need to go into that. You're talking minutes versus hours. When there's a backup of those, it takes time. We are currently trying to expand our plan review staff, but that kind of sets the domino effect into place because even if we were able to get the plan review part done, we still have to get the other parts for that permit to be issued. So there's a lot of elements that have to connect and blend together. And the, the, the true answer, I don't have the answer to why we have that, but I can explain some of the logistics, which is where I'm, I'm kind of going with it. It's not just one, we can't fix this one issue and then it correct all of the problems that we face. So we're working together trying to get a solution to that. Um, there's, there's been some other addresses that I've had with uh, recent uh, things with the same comments of four weeks and things. Some of those things, when they get clogged into the, the system, they fall through. We do try to get the, the permits that don't take very long, like a mechanical change out, an AC change out, you know, those things. There's no reason, or solar or a roof, they, they don't need to wait months and things. But we also, they go in line from where they come in. When we try to help, um, and I'm gonna use myself as the example, uh, learning the system is a little bit difficult. And I've gotten through navigating that. Um, but I think once I get my comfort level up and we get some additional help in there, I think we're gonna see a pretty good uh, turnaround getting these times reduced. Well, because I had heard rumors, um, there are apps available for our system, but prior administrators decided they wanted to save money and not utilize them. That's why I'm asking what resources are needed, because I look at it time as money, right? I agree. Your staff time is very valuable, and if we can reduce the amount of time by an app or an add-on to the system, then that's a necessity. Yep. That, that's not a, a maybe. Another thing I noticed, and um, I believe in years past this has changed, and this, this goes to paper pushing. Paper pushing takes so much extra time, right? So when you submit an application, let's say I'm gonna use an addition, for instance, okay? So you're doing a home addition, a big thing right now is the, the, let's add an office, let's add a den, I'm gonna convert my garage into an office. That's a big thing right now, right? And when you fill out the building permit, in the building permit list, your licensed electrician, your licensed mechanical, so you've got, and then your licensed plumber, right? And if Correct. you have anything else, your roofer. They're all listed, and that's signed and notarized by the general contractor, correct? So What's the, signed and notarized? The building document that's submitted with your permit. The so application. when we submit the building application, it's signed and notarized by the general contractor who's in charge of that project, and they're listing the mechanical, the electrical, the plumbing, and all the necessary, right? Yes. Why is it also required that now um, you gotta go get the mechanical, he's gonna fill out a mechanical paperwork, that's gonna be submitted with the same application, then the plumber is gonna go submit and fill out a separate plumbing application to submit with the same application for the same exact job, and the electrical is doing the same thing and getting his sign notarized and submitting it for the same amount, it's the same job. So you you didn't know that was going, yeah. Well, there, and so there's, why? Yeah, that's an interesting. I mean, that's a lot of paperwork. It's an interesting scenario, um, but that is something that can happen. I, ideally, what would be best is you would have one general and then they list those, not the individuals. So let me give That's you- That's how it was. And now all of a sudden they're saying the GC's listing it on the application. Right. But I won't take that unless every one of these trades submit their own at the separate application in your packet. They won't take it. I'm just telling you that's a whole lot of extra paperwork and not to mention time. So I'm processing time getting every one of the trades to sign their own form out on top of putting it on the GC's form. And the reason I'm bringing this up is you've got a lot of trades out here. These, these trades are running around like chickens with their heads cut off and you're gonna nail them down to try to sign another form and they're like, why aren't you doing like every other city is? Why, why am I doing this? Why are you guys making us all do this again? So I'm bringing it up because I'm 
getting yelled at for redundant paperwork. And then it's like, you know, you're making your staff do extra work by having all these extra forms. So that's how it used to be. And it just, I'm gonna say in the last year or so changed where it's like, oh no, we can't take this no more. You need to go get their own. So I, yeah, so that's, that would be awesome. That was actually on my list to have a chit chat with Mr. Peters and you, but since you're here tonight, I would love to see what you guys can do to fix that. Um, but you know, I, your, your staff has done amazing, like I said. Um, the difference has been night and day, and they do tend to, I see a lot of cross training down there, which I think is awesome. So you guys were talking about how you have these individuals doing this and these three people doing this. But I will tell you, I, literally I've walked in there and everybody was busy and I've watched them say, hey, I'm gonna jump the line here. I don't have anything in, how can I help you? And I, I wanna say that cross training that you guys have going on down there, I think is an amazing asset. And I don't know how much farther we can take that cross training, but um, it does do a lot. I'm hearing a lot of positive, you know, and they've even commented on, wow, you know, staff is jumping in and everybody's cross trained and everybody's helping everybody in that department. So I will say, I don't see as much as the planning in the back as I do you guys in the front, the permitting, but, um, that is a big help, but they do have a lot of questions on the time frame. And I know it's not just you guys, I'm gonna throw this out here because there's five million people watching. Um, Vice Mayor. Every I, city's behind as well. We, we need, we we need, need to another, and extend the meeting. We need another motion. Can we extend the meeting for 15 more minutes? We've got a motion by Vice Mayor Bradford. Only 15 minutes. And a second by Commissioner McCoy. So I'll let, you, I'll let you delve into that and I'll let somebody else speak at that, but those were just the biggest things that I'm hearing. Thank you. You don't I just wanted to add um, how we just changed our zoning technician to work under our planning staff. That is also going to allow our front end staff to have a little more efficiency on the intake process. And then it's also going to develop your zoning technician on the planning side. So you'll see some real neat changes coming forward with that. And that just went into place May 1st. Thank you. I think we're going to go to Commissioner McCool, and I think that's going to. Two questions. Two questions. I don't want them answered now, but I want, at time certain, within two weeks, I want this in my inbox. I want to understand when we're going to be caught up, because we are not caught up. And I want to know, what is it we need to get caught up? Is it more staff? Is it a different software? I don't want the answer now. I want it talked about though, but because we need that, as the vice mayor said, we are building at a rapid pace and we're not keeping up with what we could be doing. And it's not staff. I believe it's shortage of staff and we, everybody I think up on this dais supports that. So no answer now, but I want to know what it is. Do we need inspectors? Do we need software? Do we need planners? What is it that we need? because this is growing our city. So no answers tonight, I'm done with that. I just wanna know and I want this answered, what is it we need and when are we gonna get caught up? Because the permitting process, I have businesses in my district and outside call me all the time about this and residents getting frustrated. What do we need, okay, to get caught up? You're here, welcome. Thank you, Thank you. Commissioner McCool, Commissioner Jody Lee. Well, mine was, I see the code compliance is sitting there too, or we getting, I was gonna ask a couple questions about code compliance, not so much the building. But the code compliance, I was here for the last magistrate hearing, and I noticed we have 15 code compliant officers sitting here. Can't we get one supervisor to present the evidence instead of having 15 code officers sitting here for the magistrate's hearings and kind of nail it down like a regular courthouse they do where the supervisor brings up the information instead of having 15 employees sitting here cackling and playing in the corner like I seen last time. And I'm also curious about how often code drives around the entire city looking at different incidences because we've been told, several of us commissioners have been told though to make a list of violations we see, well, if we got that many code officers riding around town, I don't think we need to make a list. They should see it themselves. Thank you. Do you want to? I'll take it. No. Okay, thank you. Um, so the night of the magistrate, what happens is, is each of the code, off, code compliance officers that have witnessed the case and have processed the case, they have to be here to present on their own case. Why can't it be like a regular courthouse, like you know, the police make a report, they give it to a person and a supervisor, you know, state attorney takes care of it, presents it to the judge. Okay. Isn't that basically the same thing? 
we can look into that. Did you want to add Marion? Marion has been with uh, co-compliance for a while and she might yeah, shed some more light. I've run into her before. Uh, Marion Laracy, code compliance supervisor. I do know that when we do, as code officers and animal control, we do have to go before a judge. We, are, as ourselves, has to present the case in front of a judge. So it's the same as a magistrate. I don't know how long, how the difference is between law enforcement and code compliance, but because we have the as evidence, we're the ones that took the pictures, submitting those photos as evidence, we have to, we have to testify to the um, violation of the code. I'm sorry? It's, there's a state, it's in the state statute 162. Sorry. How often y'all drive around the city looking for, is it just on re phone calls that y'all drive around and find stuff or when you're driving around you see violations at a city ordinance? Um, well, we work in a reactive and proactive um, situations. We're seven days a week. Uh, we have two different shifts, Sunday through Wednesday and then Wednesday through Saturday. Okay, I'm good. Mr. Chisholm, to, to end it, thank you. Guys, thank you for everything. To end it, do, would, remember some time ago I asked for an operational audit specifically because I would help pinpoint the areas where we're deficient and you, you said that this was a good idea. What, what did you need from us to go forward with that? Because that would point out some of the, the technological issues we have and maybe some of the staffing issues we have. I just need to follow up. I just haven't done that one. Okay, so we need to work, wait for an actual uh, commission meeting for, for that consensus yeah, me, or? <clears throat> I, I just haven't followed up since we talked the last time okay. and I'm just gonna have to, you know, something I have to do. Okay, so let's move forward. Do uh, city manager comments? I have none. None, meeting's adjourned.